This is Terry R. Hill, and this is the story behind all of my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Terry R. Hill. Find all of the archives of the show at HankGarner.com. If you find some episodes that you like in the archives, would you do me a favor and share those with your friends, family, and loved ones? I would really appreciate that. I hope you enjoy all the great shows that we bring you, and the reason we're able to bring you such great content is because of our sponsors, and I would like to thank some of those sponsors. If you would like to sponsor the show and highlight your product or service to our audience, go to hanggarner.com, and there's a link in the menu there at the top that says Advertise, and you can highlight your product or service to our audience. Nick Breaker's book, Essence, book one Septima, one of the best science fiction writers I know. Nick Breaker weaves some of the best science fiction adventure stories you'll ever read. Essence, book one Septima, is a must read. Go pick it up today. There's a link to it in the show notes. Third Scribe is the place for authors and readers to meet. Go to thirdscribe.com. You can set up an account for free and you can link up with some of your favorite authors and find out what's going on with them. Authors, you need to have a place where you can highlight your books to your audience. Thirdscribe.com is built especially around books, linking people that love books with people that write books. Go visit them today. Thirdscribe.com. Tell Robin the folks that I sent you. Tales from the canyons of the damned episode 20 just dropped today it is amazing with stories by jess west rhett bruno amen ambrose bob williams tales is my favorite monthly publication go pick it up today and get that old pulp goodness feeling tales from the canyons of the damned episode number 20 out right now also don't forget uh, we're highlighting tales of dystopia this week and We've got a special interview show with some of the authors from it, but Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia, 13 stories of animals and humans interacting at the end of the world. Uh, This project also benefits Pets for Vets, one of uh, the most outstanding charities out there, linking up rescue animals with veterans that need some companionship. So go pick up a copy of Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia. It's only 99 cents while it launches. At the end of the show, don't forget we have an audio book clip from Richard Thieves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, my friend Terry Hill is on the show with me. Uh, Terry was on the show back episode 91. I was looking earlier today to see how long it had been, and Terry, it's been entirely too long. Um, I know, Hank. I know. <laughs> so, uh, looks like March of 2016, which is a, about a year and a half uh, since uh, since you you were on. So, I, I'm really happy to have you back. Thanks for joining me today. My pleasure is mine. Thank you. Well, uh, you've got a couple of really cool projects uh, to talk about today, and uh, since <laughs> since you were on the show previously, and and uh, we've already answered the uh, the first question of the show back then, um, tell us what's been going on with you. You you had a pretty eventful year this year, haven't you? Yeah, Hank. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's um, it's it's what you plan in life, and then what does it say that that. Life is what happens when you're busy making plans. That's right. right. <laughs> That's kind of been the truism for my life for the last couple of years. Uh, I finished up my uh, science fiction series in the days of humans with the release of Evolutions. I believe it was the latter part of last year. It kind of blurs together. Um, and then you know, I was listening to one of your podcasts the other day where uh, the guys from Keystroke Mediums talk about um, the delayed gratification of, you know, kind of working through the hard part of your novels and, you know, not get too distracted. Or when you finish that part, you go and work on the thing that's been distracting you for a while. And that was kind of one of my, um, 
kind of one of my rewards, I guess, as well. There's been this kind of story brewing in the back of my head for years. And it's just, a, you know, a story that I felt needed its own uh, book. You know, it's just one of those stories that need to be told. And, and so when I finished Evolutions, I decided uh, to uh, go ahead and pursue this distraction, if you will, um, uh, the story that's been back in my mind. And, you know, it's completely not science fiction, but, you know, any good story, regardless of the genre, is, is a story about people. So that's what I did. And I wrote the book, uh, Joseph of Bethlehem. Um, and uh, we can talk more about that later. And then, then life happened. <laughs> and uh, Hurricane Harvey came, Harvey came to Texas and Louisiana and several states after that. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of caught us all off guard. And, of course, living in the Gulf Coast, you know, hurricanes are nothing new. It's just kind of a standard part of more than half of your each of your year. Uh, but, you know, when it does come to your doorstep and turn into a hundred, a thousand year flooding event, it, it tends to change life a little bit. And, you know, you, you go into kind of survival mode and and, um, you know, we were lucky enough to be spared by it. But, you know, I did go and help out uh, several in the community who were not and through the advent of that and posting, you know, kind of what the real life experiences were for those who were not part of it and who wanted to help and wanted to understand more of what was going on. Um, you know, the, the, it, all of that culmination of experience kind of turned itself into uh, another project, which we can also talk in more detail. Absolutely. And uh, I definitely want to get to Joseph and then to, to Harvey uh, in just a minute. But the last time you were on the show, uh, Third Exodus was out and New Dawn, the second in the trilogy, and you were working on Evolutions, but it, it wasn't out yet. Um, so what was that uh, experience like finishing that trilogy and uh, kind of having that, that long dream that you had been working on for quite a while, seeing it you know, finally finished and, uh, as, as the writer and the creator, uh, kind of what's that feeling like to close the, you know, that chapter of, of your life and your writing? Yeah, it's, um, uh, probably bittersweet, I guess is the best way of experiencing it. You know, it's, it's, and as a father, you can attest to this. It's kind of like seeing your kids, uh, you know, struggle to raise them, to try and turn them into good people. And then, seeing them graduate college, high school and then, you know, they, they go out into the world, you know, and as good people and you know, you're proud of them and, you know, they're, they've got a bright future and they're making good decisions. But on the flip side, you know, it's really heart wrenching to let go. Right? Um, you know, I, I think it's the same with any creation, you know, it's part of the, it's part of most of this experience of creating it. But when you see it fulfilled, you're sad because, you know, it's kind of come to some logical conclusion but at the flip side, you know, it's a very rewarding experience to have not only accomplished it, but um, produced something that um, is valued by others. You know, that's a, that's a creative element that, you know, until you've actually done it, you, you don't fully appreciate the whole rewarding creative element of, of producing something that people value, you know? Yeah. Um, remind everybody what you do for your day job. <laughs> uh, the day job. Um, yes, um, I am a aerospace engineer with almost 20 years experience working at the NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And I've had a very um, journeyman's uh, experience at NASA working on multiple different flight programs um, within engineering. Uh, spent about engineering spacesuit design uh, and I was the deputy program manager for the astronaut health program for several years, and now I'm the um, enterprise architecture lead, technical lead for, uh, what is it, the medical uh, informatics systems for human spaceflight. Nice. Um, and and you, uh, you actually work with, uh, with astronauts to, uh, if I remember right, to... Uh, try to uh, like track their health uh, pre-flight, during flight, and, and then get, follow up with them after flight to, to try to you know, gather data as to what happens to people and also just to make sure that the, the astronauts are well taken care of, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you know, as part of that program, they've gotten uh, authorized this last year to provide <clears throat> health services for, for life now, um, 
uh, from an occupational standpoint, you know, like, like, uh, you would with like inner DOD, DOE energy workers, you know, people deal with hazard situations. So what we found is we, the effects of, um, the acute effects of space flight are, have been fairly well characterized uh, with very few surprises as of recent. Um, so, and also a lot of the mitigation things that we put forth seem to be working really well. Um, and luckily, uh, we haven't seen any overt uh, chronic problems, like lifetime problems with the exposure of space, space flight. So those are all very positive things. Now, you know, I'll say also we haven't flown a statistically large number of people either. So... Uh, <laughs> You know? <laughs> but, but we do have the benefit of 40 some odd years uh, of studying people though, right? Exactly. You know, 50 years and 50 almost, years. Four, almost 400 astronauts um, later. So we've collected a sizable amount of data. And, you know, the difference is like the medical community, they, they, you know, see millions of patients every year, but they may only see them once a year. Whereas we've got a tremendous, we have very few astronauts but we got tremendously deep volume of data per astronaut right so you know we probably understand the astronaut individual astronaut physiology you know greater than any other person on the planet <laughs> yeah yeah I, I can imagine um as someone who works in the industry and then goes home at night and is a science fiction writer uh does it feel like taking your work home with you uh or you know does it feel like i'm just getting to imagine you know, where we will be, um, it, do, do those lines ever blur across with you? Well, they do blur, but you know, in very discreet and intentional ways. Um, <laughs> uh, because, you know, I think, you know, I think every part of fiction, whether it's speculative fiction or science fiction or, you know, what have you, it plays its own role. Right. Um, I think if it weren't for the stories of science fiction, then you wouldn't have, powered the dreams of the engineers that later made things happen like lasers and rockets and, you know, men on the moon. If it, if it hadn't been for people, you know, a hundred years ago or less, um, but up with these stories and these just you know, what type things, then, you know, we, I don't think we would have been nearly as far along as we are today. And that's just for your imagination and innovation side of things. There's also, you know, the moral and the ethical side of things, which, you know, science fiction is an excellent medium in which to explore what if scenarios and you know should, should if scenarios you know what i'm saying so i so i think you know for me it, i'm able to take you know my day job and include as much realism as possible in the fiction which kind of sounds like an oxymoron but you know it's I, I i like to apply the realism not not just to make it hard science fiction because i think that you can kind of paint yourself in a corner of hard, hard science fiction but you know, I think you can still um, portray the realism without having to go uber hard sci-fi. Right. Um, hello, Terry. Yes, I'm here. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You, you, your audio cracked and dropped out for just a second. So, um, so that you, hard science fiction without, and, and that I lost you. Oh, I was just saying, uh, you know, you can have the hard science fiction without really having to over constrain yourself, um, you know, by including facts, you, it helps create a realistic scenario and realistic events uh, without uh, painting yourself into a, a hard science fiction where you're over constrained by the technology. And, but, you know, the story is more about the people, but the details are more accurate, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so the the three books together in the trilogy um, – you know, probably north of 300,000 words? Uh, yes. Yes, I believe. I think they average between 120 to 140,000 per book. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So with that trilogy and with uh, with several uh, shorts that you've written uh, for, for different collections and things, you really established yourself as, uh, as a science fiction writer and one that is uh, really forward-thinking um, and, and doing just amazing work. Um, and, then you. You and then you decide to write this book um, that's set 2,000 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I absolutely love, Terry. I love it so hard um, because I love seeing writers do what they're passionate about. Yeah. And, and I do not think uh, that, that we 
we should pigeonhole ourselves. And I completely understand that, you know, about marketability and, and all of that stuff and, you know, finding your genre and sticking with it. Um, but we as people have so many different um, things that we're interested in and things that we care about. And as writers, we ought to have the freedom to explore those things and write them about and write about them. Um, so tell me, tell me about Joseph and, and where he as a character uh, has come into your life and why you thought this story needed to be told. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, I agree completely. You know, it's, we, we do have varying interests and, you know, you're right. Largely, writers either intentionally or unintentionally get pigeonholed and stick to a particular genre. And I get it because, you know, once you go through the effort of developing a fan base, you don't want to confuse them with stuff that, that come out at right angles to something that's not of that genre, right? You know, you don't want to fall in love with a sci-fi writer who then starts publishing cookbooks. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it just confuses people. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, Joseph, uh, you know, it's titled Joseph of Bethlehem, the un untold story. It was one of those distractions that's been kind of in the back of my mind for years and years and years. And, um, you know, I wanted to get myself established as a writer first and hone my skills so that I could do, do credit to the story. Right. Um, you know, I was brought up, um, in the Methodist church and, you know, I would never characterize myself now as, um, uber, uh, religious or what have you. But my, there was a story there about Joseph and I, I think, um, that it was one that deserved to be told because, you know, anybody who has been a parent or anybody who has been a step parent, which is a large number of the population these days, or anybody who has been asked to, to do the right thing, uh, in a situation where it may be, um, in conflict with what you personally want to do, uh, can relate. To Joseph, because you know, you know, I guess if I were a stand-up comedian, I could say there's a lot of humor in that sit in the whole nativity situation. Oh, absolutely, there is. Uh, you're a fly on the wall, you know. You could say, yeah, you're, you're what? <laughs> and and I would even uh, I would even posit that a, a person of of real faith um, really ought to be able to find the humor in it because. Uh, uh, nothing, nothing says faith more than, than staring into the face of something that goes against everything. And, and you just having to say, okay, I, I mean, I, I, I give in, you know, right. and, and there, there is humor in that. And if you can't find the humor in that, maybe, maybe you're just taking things a little too seriously. Right. And absolutely right. But, you know, as you know, you know, you read the book and I, I treat it very seriously. You know, I, I, I treat the book with all due respect uh, that it's due. And I'm not here to uh, debate any of the major uh, logical fallacies with the story itself. I mean, it, it all holds true in the end. So not, not no spoiler alert there. But um, the story is really, you know, any good story, whether it's, you know, told in the past or the present or the future, it's about the human element, right? It's about relationships and um, experiential um, situations, right? So, but you know what we tend to forget, and you know largely it's because you know the education is not there uh, on a grand scale in the general public is you know a lot of the story that we're told about the nativity is really only come about in the last two hundred years, right the whole hallmark flavor of this young, cute couple that you know surprise you're having God's baby, you know that's <laughs> that's all just kind of come about recently, you know, back as, you know, in the middle ages when you know, they've got paintings dating back that show, you know, Joseph is an old man. He's not this young guy. Right. And Mary's not this, you know, 20 something lady. She's like 12 to 14, you know? And so it's a very different, the f older, farther back you go, it's a very different story. Um, and also, you know, what we think, uh, you know, because a lot of what we get taught in Sunday school and, and what have you and whatever subsequent s studies you have after that is that, you know, when this whole event was taking place in, in history. And if you, you know, use the Bible as, as the primary histor historical source, but there are other texts out there that are written about the same time, of which I draw upon for a lot of story development. Um, you know, God as a active participant in the people's lives 
around first century AD was not the same as it was back during Abraham's time. You know, it had been hundreds and hundreds of years, according to his, the, the, the books, hundreds of years since, you know, any burning tornadoes had happened or any seas had been split open and people walked through. I mean, that type of stuff had, had not happened for hundreds of years. So, you know, God is an active participant in the people's lives at the time. Um, that was more of a cultural history even then. So for some young girl to come forward and say, hey, I'm carrying God's child, that would have been a tough road to hoe for anybody. I mean, that would be like any um, megachurch pastor's daughter coming forward to him and telling him the same thing. How do you think that pastor would, <laughs> how, do, how do you think he would react to that, right? Yeah. That, yeah, it's, you know, uh, the, man of faith. Uh, what, what would he say? Uh, it'd, be, it'd be hard for the best of us to, you know, suck that up and go along with it, right? So, I wanted to kind of paint a realistic portrayal, portrayal of you know that scenario. Also, give um, tell the story from Joseph's perspective, who was kind of thrust right in the middle of this, unexpectedly. You know, as as you you'll see when you read the book. Um, and just kind of how he dealt with all these things. But because of the man he was, he always did the right thing. And it's and in the end, it's, it turns into a renewal of faith story, if you will, for, for Joseph. So, Terry, um, when you start uh, digging into the story, and, and like you said, the, the story has, has absolutely changed in modern history. Uh, and, and, you know, Joseph's story, uh, is obviously tied up in the story of Christmas. And, uh, you know, as, as Charlie Brown taught us, um, you know, we, we've got the story all wrong and the commercialization um, is very real. And, and, you know, it's a constant battle every, every year, uh, when we're going through this. So this book is, is timely, uh, on, you know, for, for many, Many reasons, but you know the time of year that you're releasing it. Obviously, um, when you, when you start peeling back the layers of this story, um, what surprised you the most about Joseph? Uh, you know, I guess I'll just flaunt my ignorance a lot about. Um, I guess my education in, in the whole story was not as profound as it could have been. Uh, but when I started digging through, you know, there are different texts that are written about the same time as the other books of the Bible, but were not included. They weren't included for various reasons. Um, but what surprised me most about Joseph was um, not only was he older, you know, he was 40s, 50s-ish, was a widower and had children of his own. Um, but he was not a willing participant in any of this. That's, uh, I guess, what really surprised me the most. And I need to caveat that. If you treat the older texts that were not included in the Bible as relatively as accurate as the books that were included in the Bible, you know, all things being fair and equal, um, you know, it's kind of the caveat you have to lay on top of all this and you can't take it, any of it too terribly seriously, right? So, but if you, if you do take that, if you, you know, do treat them as equal and, you know, can surmise that he really was not a willing participant in the whole betrothal to Mary and, and what have you. You know, that was, that was a quite an eye opener to me. And, and not only that, but, you know, also documented in these texts that were written, you know, some a hundred years or less after um, Jesus was born. So, I mean, we're talking about written relatively recently after the events. Um, you know, he had a hard time at it. The, the, the community was not welcoming, and he, they got called onto the carpet a couple of times, particularly when Mary um, turned up pregnant. And uh, that was all just very new and surprising to me. Yeah, well, you're not the only one that's uh, uh, ignorant, uh, if you will, of, of Joseph's story, because we, we just don't have a lot of uh, a lot of reference for him in, in modern uh, culture and, and, and modern religious culture even. He's just pretty much left out of the story um right you know because um 
because we you know the the story focuses on 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 Jesus obviously the 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 son of god and uh so where does that leave joseph if you are the son of god uh you know what about the the guy that you spend every day with and that that trains you you know how to do this and how to do that um and uh i, I always thought that that uh that joseph got the short end of the stick of the story um so so well, you're right he, i mean he definitely got relegated to the shadows of history you know yeah, for sure, for sure. And um, you know, what does it what does it have to be like uh to be the person personally responsible for the safety and the well being um, you know, of the son of God, no, no matter how you you know, if you believe the story or not. Um you know, that that's a that has to be an awesome responsibility and uh and the humility that goes, you know, along with that and, and uh it's just phenomenal. I I think there's so many things we can learn from from Joseph, uh, where do you begin trying to learn about him when when we do know so little, because so so many of the traditions have not been passed down about him. So where do you begin looking? Right, you know. So I, you know, started just digging through. Uh, well, like any good writer, I start scroll uh, trolling the internet. Right, <laughs> <laughs> just doing. Um, searches to you know to kind of see what um comes up and what i find in the dark and what one clue leads to the next and you know find different text and and i've read uh one good book um and as we're talking i'll see if i can come up with a reference uh that also listed a lot of other good uh archival texts that you can look for but you know just there are certain books out there that were written and are now been transcribed and available, you know, on the internet that are, you know, like I said, been transcribed from uh, back at the time, you know, the Apocrypha, uh, the Gospel of Nativity of Mary or the Perviculum of James uh, or the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, you know, what have you, or even some references uh, to the Quran uh, Surah. You, you, you can go piece those together, but also there's also good Bible resources out there that have... Uh, a lot of searchable text, and you can pull it all together. And what I've done is because, you know, the story, in some ways, of Joseph is so hard to believe. You know, the story that I've woven together, you're reading this, you're like, man, boy, Terry just kind of jumped way off on the left field with his imagination and all this stuff. But in re So what I've done is I've actually documented, I mean, there's what, 40 or 50 pages in the back of the book documenting the text that I pulled the story from chapter by chapter. So, you know, as you see the story unfolds, you know, major blocks of story I pulled directly from these uh, ancient texts that are not included in the Bible. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a very big eye opener. So I try to left a, a good breadcrumb for those who read the book that want to learn more about it and, you know, kind of want to start the research upon their own. Love it. Um, Terry, as you know, the we live in interesting times. Uh, <laughs> I, I I don't know that our our society, uh, uh, American society uh, in particular, because both of us live here, um, uh, and I, I'm sure it's this way around the world uh, in, in a lot of places as well. But we we live in a very politically charged climate um, where crazy things happen every single day. Um, and, and the, due to those crazy things or, or maybe, uh, fed by it, uh, you know, we, we seem to be extremely divided, uh, as a nation. And if we don't agree with one another's politics, you know, we've seen, you know, friendships, you know, torn apart and, oh, yeah. and all this just, it's just a, it's a crazy, crazy time. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and religion is, is wrapped up in a lot of that as well. And, yep. uh, you know, it's a, it's just a. It's a it's a crazy time to 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 put things out publicly that you believe uh, or that you want to talk about. Maybe you're curious about things um, because you know the 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 troll farm is uh, in full effect these days. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, so uh, you know when you start you know, start a project like this, and <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I think you know where I'm going. Oh yeah. Uh, what what are some of the things that that go through your mind? You know, do I even want to tackle something like this? Because, um, you know, the the hardcore evangelicals may not like that I'm uh, using, um, you know, pseudo apocryphal, uh, 
you know, um, sources, uh, you know, and maybe I'm quoting from something that's not in the biblical canon. Uh, and then maybe people on the opposite end of the spectrum are, you know, Terry, why are you even dabbling in this story? Um, who cares? It's all fairy tales. Uh, you know, that there comes a point where you're not going to please everybody. And, uh, you know, so as a writer and as someone who is curious and uh, and who is dedicated to his craft, um, how do you step out in faith, um, so to speak, um, that you get to, to do the thing that you as an artist want to do um, without worrying what everybody is going to think about it? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, again... Um, you know, a large portion of Joseph, the story was for my benefit, uh, you'd be brutally honest. And this is, this is something that I did for me. Um, but I th- hope that other people can enjoy it. And, you know, as I say in the front part of the text of the book itself, and then the, the, the lead in of the intro is that uh, who knew, who really knows, right? Who really knows what happened back then? You know, the, all that we have is the texts that have been written down, and we all know that a lot of the ancient texts contradict each other. Um, also, the text of which was written back in the day, the intent of the text, the books that were written, was different. I mean, today we write history books for the purpose of documenting history, right? But back then, they wrote stories to make points, and attention to detail and fact was of lesser importance. And that's also something that's not broadly taught and explained to people. Um, it was history mixed with of, metaphor. Exactly. That's what I was saying, metaphors. And so, you know, you really got to take a lot of it with a grain of salt. But but to get back to your question, why, why on earth, Terry, would you do this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> why would you subject yourself to this? Well, I don't know if I really come up with a good answer for that one yet, but other than, you know, I... I think it's a, a good, there's a good story there, Dale. There's a good story about a man, about a man who is tortured like all of us, a man who struggles with doing the right thing versus what he particularly wants out of life, right? Carrying the badge of character is not an easy thing for anybody. I mean, we all struggle with it, some better than others. And, you know, whether or not, you know, the book is not about questioning um, immaculate conception. The book is not about questioning um, age-appropriate relationships. The book is not about um, you know whether or not you know Jesus was the Son of God or not. But it's not what the book is about. The book is about a man who has been dealt a difficult hand, to say the least, in a very difficult time in history. I mean that. You know, it's um, that was also another eye-opening experience for me. Or information was the deeper I dug into it, the more I didn't realize how politically unstable the area was at the time, and and what have you. So, um, it you know, it was a very difficult time, and in a lot of ways, the political environment there then is almost identical to what is now. You just replace the names of the political parties, and it's same shenanigans day after day. Um, so, you know, the story is about a man. It's it's not about questioning history it's, it's a story about a man just like any other fictitious character um you know that people love it's, it's a story about a man yeah. and 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 you said exactly what i was just thinking that um the the political climate there is is like a mirror image of now uh and and the story of joseph here really should be the story uh, that we aspire uh, to mm-hmm. that that this is a man in difficult circumstances um, that's trying to do the best he can for his family and his community and uh, and, and to make a difference and I think that is where the story absolutely shines. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, one of the other references I, I was skipping over earlier, which kind of really dug into the political environment of the time, if people are interested. Um, it's the book's called um, Zealot. It's the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth, Rhett Nazareth, written by uh, Reza Aslan, and I think he's got a some HBO special going back in history as well. But he does a phenomenal job of really laying out 
um, the different political activities of the area at the time, and Zealot being one of the political movements uh, in, in the area around the, the turn of the century, or turn, uh, turn of the millennium right there. So, Yeah. And uh, the book is available now, right? You, they can go pick it up. It would make an excellent Christmas present. Um, or, you know, it's it's not just a Christmas story. Um, but uh, but they can go pick up a copy now, right? Yes, it's available. Uh, right now it's available on Kindle and a paperback via Amazon. It will go wide later on. Um, and also, uh, I'll just go put a little there. In terms of Christmas time, uh, as most authors, I have a uh, – music listening playlist when I'm writing and I put together a list of uh, contemporary Christmas songs uh, and I cleared that in the back of the uh, front of the book if you're interested in listening to music while you're reading the story <laughs> oh how cool how cool I love that I love that um well let's let's talk about your other book uh for a minute the um this is really an interesting dovetail uh because we're talking about Joseph and in a man uh, in, in difficult and interesting times. Uh, and then while you were finishing up that story, uh, Hurricane Harvey hit and, and you live in Houston or, or around Houston, right? And, yes, the, and, and you guys were hit the hardest. Um, the storm was a, was a monster storm. Uh, but, but the worst part about it, I think was it, it came inland a little bit and didn't just stop. Didn't yep. it? Yep, exactly. Yeah. And it just dumped rain for, for days and yes. days. And uh, I, I know a lot of us were, were following along with you on Facebook as, as things kind of unfolded. And, uh, you know, it's it's really interesting to get to watch something unfold like that. Um, but but it's also very disturbing to watch your, your friends going through something and you're across the country and you have – there's absolutely nothing you can do, you know, but just watch the carnage. Um, but throughout that and, and the, you know, you documenting that, uh, this book came, uh, out of that two months with Harvey. Um, tell me a, a little bit about how this project came together and when you started realizing that this story needed to be told. Yeah. And I don't know if I can do just justice to your question, but I'll try. Um, it's. It's a complicated answer, unfortunately, because in the beginning, you know, I was just posting online um, to give information to friends and family who are concerned about how things were going uh, as they saw the storm approaching and, you know, um, and what have you. And also to pass information to you know my local friends and family who may be in the path of the storm just to kind of. You know, the whole point of social media really is to share information. So that was kind of how it started. And then, um, you know, to be honest, we in Houston didn't weren't taking it very seriously until it was too late because all the maps did not have it come in our direction. We expected to get a little bit of the dirty side, but that was it. I mean, because, you know, with experiences with the hurricanes living on the Gulf Coast, they come in, they blow the hell out of a few people, dump some rain on the you know, the northeast side of the hurricane and then move on. They usually dissipate very quickly, like a day or two. You know, one day out, the model changed and it none of the models had the storm leaving Texas. And at that point in time, everybody were like, oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, this, this this is something different, right? Yeah. And then, you know, when a hurricane comes in and just parks itself, that dirty side becomes a dangerous side because the dirty side being where all the rain falls. Uh, that becomes a very dangerous thing. And then, of course, it moved towards Houston a few days later. And, you know, by the time all things are said and done, you know, the area, Houston area that I live in, we got over four feet of rain. I mean, that's that's not, it's hard for people to understand. It's like if you were to go and map out every every square inch of your property, there was four feet of rain fell on every single square inch then you start understanding what that means. And if you were to equate that to snow for people that never had a flood, but do have snow, four feet of rain is the same. I mean, we got like 53 inches, 53 inches of rain is the same as 65 feet of snow that fell in four days. Good God. Five right. days. That, that is insane. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, until, until you experience it, it's hard to understand that, but 
it's it's a very different different because then you you are experiencing this and it just keeps going on and on and the situation gets gets worse and worse and you, know, you spend days and days under tornado warnings and you know a half of the week you're underneath the stairs with your kids because the tornado warnings are persistent um, and then and then the rain stops but you know you hear boats in your neighborhood and you should not ever hear boats in your neighborhood and, and <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, and, you know, the military are showing up with, you know, big military equipment and there's the constant buzz of helicopters around your house rescuing people and, you know, and you see the water approaching your house and, you know, you're living through that. And so a lot of the, the posts, you know, luckily I still had internet through most all of it was just to let people know, you know, we're still safe, we're still safe, but there's a lot aren't. And be ready. If you want to know how to help, this is how you can help. And then, you know, the water finally starts to subside. And, you know, I and others were able to get out into the community um, and start helping people um, to re- reclaim their lives. And you know, if you've never been through a flood, you know, one of the critical things is you've got to get the wet things out fast because you have a window of just a few days because, you know, it was over 100 degrees heat index within a day of the flood. So if you've got no power wet stuff and hundred degree weather, you got a day or two before your mold, your house just molds up and you've lost everything. Um, assuming you hadn't got wet already. So, and it was a lot of the personal experiences that, you know, of what I saw and the, the devastation of people's homes that, you know, I came in contact with and emotional visceral experiences was, you know, I was documenting via uh, posts and, and, um, to get back to your question, uh, People are like saying, Terry, you, you got to bundle this together and, you know, put it in a book form because, you know, what we're seeing here is not what we're seeing anywhere else on the media landscape. You know, we're just not seeing this type of stuff. Um, and it's traumatic and it's heartwarming. And, you know, um, to kind of go back to what we're saying, this, this day of turmoil and division amongst our nation, you know, what we saw in amongst all this devastation and travesty was – an unfathomable amount of people coming together from all stripes uh, to help each other. People driving in from other parts of the country to help out, you know, plane loads of stuff coming in from DC or money being sent from friends of friends from California. You know, it's just, it was, it was f- phenomenal and even just kind of hard to even comprehend. And, you know, when people told me I should bundle this up in the book, I, I didn't even really know how to approach doing it or even how to, how to do it or what to do with it or how to, I just didn't know what to do with it. You know, it was just, I, I didn't know. But I scratched my head and, you know, when I had to go back to my solo life but and left so many people still in need, I had a hard time doing that emotionally, you know, the whole survivor's guilt thing. And I figured out that if I could find a way to capture the hosts in their form chronologically in a book, then the reader could kind of experience and experience one person's slice of life, if you will, of that storm. I mean, you know, I didn't do anything special or heroic, but I tried to share the stories of those who did, you know, and to give, um, I mean, there's a lot, there's a billion more stories to tell about Harvey and I probably did a sad injustice to all of them. Uh, but, <laughs> but the idea but is this was that, your story to tell. Yeah. That, you didn't live those people's story. Right. But the key thing is, is, you know, all the profits that come from this book are going to be donated to those who were impacted by the storm. Because one of the key things I want to tell the story is that, you know, because of the eye of the media has now gone off to something else, that doesn't mean everything is magically okay. You know, anybody who's lived through a flooding event like this knows it's months to years before your life approaches that but even still there's a certain level of ptsd that comes with going through something like this because you know we've got hit as i mentioned in the book you know personally of the 20 years i've been in houston i've been hit by every single major storm personally and this is the first event i haven't been so you know after you've been flooded every time it rains heavy you know there's a certain amount of pucker factor that goes along with that absolutely and that persists for years uh, we went through Hurricane Katrina, and uh, as someone that's lived near the Gulf Coast, uh, you know, almost my entire life, uh, you know, you you are right about hurricanes, and and uh, th- there comes a point where you just ca- you don't get really worked up about 
those kinds of storms. They're, they're, they're a fact of life when you live, you know, this close to the water. You're going to get a certain number of storms ever so often. Um, you know, you bundle up as good as you can. You, you secure stuff as good as you can. It's going to blow like hell for a day or two. And then, you know, you, you clean up and you go on about life. Uh, when, when Katrina came through, uh, you know, we're about an hour off of the coast and, uh, it, on the immediate coast, they got a lot of storm surge, uh, you know, a lot of water pushed in and there was some serious flooding and, and stuff just washed away, uh, but no long-term flooding. And then when it got up to where we, it was, it was still a category three when it got to our house and we had three pine trees that landed on our house and one of them came right through our living room. We could reach up and touch a pine tree laying, you know, through our living room. Um, and, but, but the weird thing is the next morning after the storm had gone, it's all blue skies and sunshine and birds are chirping. And, uh, it's just a, a, a bizarre thing. I, I cannot imagine, uh, what you guys went through for such a sustained amount of time. Uh, and, and, and nobody else can imagine that either. It's it. And that's why this book is so important that, um, that this really is a, uh, more than once in a lifetime event, uh, I think you said it's once in a in a thousand year flood. They're yeah. calling it. Yep, it's insane. Yeah, um, and that's and you, you just can't fathom that amount of water. You can't. You just can't fathom it's, that, and it's it's. Um, and, but the really odd thing is, it's there, and then two days later, it's gone. And right, you know, your first instinct is, well, I'll just wash everything off, and it'll dry out, right? <laughs> well, no, this is a whole different thing. Yeah, because you know. It's the whole microbes and stuff that you can't see and all the man-made stuff that gets washed in and around and, you know, it's, it's all there. And if it gets wet, it has to be thrown away. And that's kind of the weird thing about it. With, with a hurricane, you've got this force of nature that comes and just destroys things, right? It's something you can point to. You can look out the window and see. But with a flood, you are the person that's destroying your house. You're the person that's ripping it apart and throwing your kids' toys away. And it's that level of um, – it's, 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 you know, it's, a, it's a discontinuity of you know, what the way life should be. You know? it's, you're, the, you're not the person that should be doing this, right? It's, uh, there always should be some other monster or something that's responsible for this devastation, but it's really you. You are the one that's doing this, and that's just what um, kind of makes this whole experience very bizarre and 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 more, I think, emotional impact uh, than a lot of other situations. Um, you you uh, you talked about the the eye of the media uh, that was uh, so intensely focused on on y'all for you know a week to a week and a half. And then, uh, you know, and then it left and, and we started, you know, talking about, you know, politicians and, 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 uh, you know, mass shootings and, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the attention, uh, you know, goes elsewhere. Uh, so the, the attention on that you're placing in this book, uh, is vital because you you were documenting things that were happening not only during the storm but after the storm. Um, kind of what is the what is the focus of this book? The the, the time focus. When does it begin and and when does it end? Yeah, that's a good good point. Um, <laughs> the 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 book starts a few days before Harvey was named a hurricane, and I did that intentionally because um, you know was it not even four days before the storm we had those total solar ips that kind of passed across most of the united states and that was the first time or that'd be the last time for another hundred years before it does it to such a degree right so i mean it was generally a big deal and that's what everybody's focused on that's what i was focused on and you know what have you and then a friend of mine said oh by the way you got some some storm tracks heading your direction to keep an eye out and i was like okay whatever you know i didn't pay much attention to it and but within just 48 hours, things changed. So the scope of the book is to really kind of demonstrate that this kind of popped out of nowhere. And like the title says, it's two months with Harvey. So, um, you know, to the best of my ability, I wanted to document, um, you know, at least the first two months of the experience of dealing with Harvey and what people are going through, you know, the weeks, the days and the weeks after the storm has cleared out. Uh, there's a lot of, most everybody that I know 
that was impacted by the storm are still waiting for money from the insurance companies, be it FEMA or private home insurance or what have you. They're still waiting for the money. And what people are having to do is take out personal loans to rebuild, not knowing really what um, what money may be coming their way. And so, and that's assuming you had flood insurance. There's a lot of individuals, like my own town, um, a third of the town was flooded. The homes were flooded in a third of the town. All of that, that's 3,000. So let's make the math easy. 3,000 homes got flooded in my little town. 2,500 and didn't have any flood insurance. Oh, man. Right? So where does that money come from? So the, you know, that, and FEMA's not going to always help you out to the degree that you need. So, you know, there, there's personal stories there. And so, you know, it's, it's, you know, I could carry the story on for two years and maybe I'll update it from time to time. But the point was, is I wanted to document really what the real conditions were get this book out there so that in a timely way to help generate some revenue for those people that need help for all those people that don't have flood insurance and FEMA's not going to buy them out or what have you. Um, you know, there's still a tremendous amount of need out there. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, so, so what is life like now? Um, uh, the, these people that, that lost everything, uh, where do they go? And, um, you know, the, the, so, so if, if someone, let's say someone is in the best case scenario where they have insurance, um, they, they maybe have to take out a personal loan to start rebuilding, uh, and, and, you know, hopefully insurance is going to pay all that back and, and all that's just assume everything works correctly, uh, in the system there. Uh, but in the meantime, where are all these people staying and, and how is, how is life getting back to normal uh, in the midst of all this rebuilding and, and all this, you know, desolation. Yeah. And, you know, you can, you can attest to this because you've been hit by a hurricane. There is no normal. There's, there's no getting back to normal. There's a new, new. <laughs> right. Right. Um, you know, best case scenario, one of my former neighbors, um, they ended up with four feet of water throughout their entire house. Okay. So, their best case scenario, because FEMA's helping them out, they also have flood insurance. They also, because they had so much water in their house, they're on the list of FEMA buyouts so that um, they can get assistance. And if it's very complicated, but there is a possibility they could get money to have the federal combination of federal and local government buy out their property so that no house is ever rebuilt on that flood zone, which is a good thing. But and, you know, they're also in a good case scenario because they are also were able to find a home that they could rent for them and their two children. Um, so, you know, life has proceeded on relatively normally for them, although there still is this thing hanging out there about what they're going to where their permanent home is going to be and what they're going to do with their property that keeps getting flooded. Best case scenario, another case scenario, maybe not best case, but uh, another couple that I family I went and helped out. Um, he, they were, have been, have been, and are still living with friends of theirs. So they got two families living in one home. Um, they have flood insurance, but they haven't gotten any money back. So they took out personal loans and have begun the rest restoration of their home. And, you know, as, as they, the insurance comes back, you know, inevitably you have to haggle with them to try and get them to cover the actual cost of restoring your, 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 your situation and paying back your loans. And then there's a, the example of a couple that I helped and, um, you know, they had health disabilities, they had flood insurance, but, uh, FEMA wasn't helped them out. And, you know, they have a long tragic story as to why that was the case, but they are unlimited income and they can't afford to even rent a one room apartment because they just don't have that savings and they can't take out a loan because they weren't working. So they're having to live in their flooded out, gutted home. And, um, you know, I guess if, if no one has ever been through that, then you, you may not fully appreciate what that means. But, um, you know, if you could just imagine taking a 40 year old, 50 year old home, filling it with water and then ripping all the sheet rock out and, you know, you're left with, you know, dirty stud walls with nails here and there and, you know, 
it looks like a house that's you know been in abandoned, you know, and what have you, but you're still living there. Uh, so you know the stories. I mean, there's m- much more varying stories out there from that, but that that's kind of the wide gambit, and that's the that's the current condition right now. I mean, how many months are we after? Yeah, we're pushing three to four months now, aren't we? Right. So. So there's, I mean, it's an ongoing story, and the hope is not to, just just to try and draw people's attention back to, you know, this this story is not over yet. This need is still there, and right, you know, but it's also to try and to try and paint a positive situation in a really bad story was yeah. how people came together, and you know, the amount of water far surpassed what Katrina dropped. Oh yeah. But, you know, for various reasons, and I would like to, you know, attribute to people pulling together because of Katrina and learning from the lessons of Katrina that they were able to, mo- um, you know, motivate and mobilize in ways that kept the Katrina tragedy from happening again. Well, it, it's an interesting juxtaposition, um... Uh, this story laid on top of what we were talking about earlier, uh, living in one of the most politically charged, you know, moments in history, uh, that the human spirit and the, the innate, uh, kindness of, of people that, that when tragedy happens, uh, we have this weird ability to, to drop that baggage and go help our neighbor. Um, and you know, if if we could make, take the lessons from these two stories that you're that you're bringing us and and merge them together, um, uh, you know, in in some way that we could you know hopefully rise uh, to to be our better selves, you know, daily, and, and not wait for you know another Harvey to come along. I agreed, and that that was you know I kind of mentioned that in the book was you know I, everything that we did during, you know, Harvey and what have you, you know, our ability to walk into a stranger's home and help them, no questions asked, or have strangers walk by and say, what do you need? I'll go get it from the store or just offer you food and water and drink. And, you know, just no questions asked. Here you go. Um, if we're willing to do that in that situation, let's remember and try not to get calloused and uh, ignore those in need when things are not quite as dire, you know? Right, right. You know, it doesn't take a. It doesn't. You don't have to be affiliated with a certain religion or a political party to make you a good person. You know, <laughs> you can be. A, you can be a good person without being part of any of those. You know, you sure can. You sure and you should. Um, it, you shouldn't need to be told to be a good person. Right. It it should just just be your default reaction. Um, it's an amazing book, Terry. Uh, this is a, a unique form factor in uh, you know, kind of the indie writing community where we're used to. Um, you know, producing books and, and, and a lot of us have, have learned the, the ins and outs of, of, of you know, producing a, a Kindle version of a book and, and, and then the, the uh, accompanying paperback. But this, this book demanded uh, a little different setup. How did you uh, approach the, the actual layout of the book and, and how did that affect the end product and, and how you're selling it? Yeah, that's, that's a key point. That was a new learning experience for me and, and, you know, honestly, that was really what was my one of the biggest hangups in figuring out how to make this thing come to reality was really, like I said, the form factor and the medium. Um, unfortunately, well, not fortunately, fortunately, the 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 part that tells the story in this case are the images. Um, you know, I can describe what a flood means, but until you see a flood. You know, I can describe a scene where there, you know, there's just this river of water where a street used to be and there are people wading up to their necks in water and boats going around. It's dark, it's hazy, and the wind is blowing. But until you see that picture with real people, it doesn't have the, quite the same impact, uh, you know, the, the oh crap factor to it, you know. Uh, so this story demanded to be highly visual, right, and... Um, unfortunately there's no good way that I found yet to make that happen such that you can view it on your phone, <laughs> like on Kindle on your phone, or you might could pull it off on an iPad and you could, 
make it work on a computer, but you know, the nice versatile part of the Kindle is that it can go seamlessly across, you know, all those different formats. But it's very hard to do that with pictures because when you start scaling pictures, they a lot of times they become so small and uh, the flow of the story uh, gets broken up. But also what compounded the, the challenge with this was telling the story because, um, you know, the story was originally told via my singular posts one after another, right? It's, it's really kind of a stream of consciousness thing. And I could have taken all that and written uh, more of a documentary style, historical accounting of what happened. But, um, well, one, it would have taken, you know, be honest, it would have taken a lot more time than I had available to get this out to market so that I could hopefully start helping people with it. Um, but two, I think, you know, it, it's kind of a testament to the social media and how we share information because, you know, how we as humans share information has changed dramatically over the last 15 years. Um, and social media is kind of its own new beast and, uh, <laughs> use it for good or evil, you know, what have you. But, uh, <laughs> but I think there's a certain power to it. And it, it allowed, it allowed me to maintain the, uh, emotional, the personal emotional connect, connectedness to these series of events by posting my own thoughts and my own experiences with my top stamp and what day it was and, you know, who, who's I sh- information I share because, um, this is me. This is my story, and this is how I experienced it moment by moment by moment. And since you know Facebook is so it's permeated our very society as much as it has, it's a familiar format now. So by finding a book that I could have, you know, two posts side by side on a page, you know, I could potentially have four across both pages, and you could just read down through in a very stream of consciousness kind of way. Uh, to kind of see the, the the story unfold, and and you know from some of the re- reports I've gotten back from people who have read it, they're saying, you know, I, I had to stop and <clears throat> set it down and pick it back up because I just couldn't handle that amount of motion in one sitting. <clears throat> and you know, um, I'm glad that the emotion carried through. You know, I'm not willing, I'm not wanting to you know, drag anybody unwillingly through it, but I think with all good stories that evoke emotion, you come back a different person having been through them. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, and the, it's a, it's an, uh, a great paperback format that you put together, um, with the, uh, the images and the, uh, the, the running commentary from you on what's going on. Um, I, I highly recommend this book, not only, uh, just to, uh, t- so people can understand what happened, uh, but also because, uh, the dollars that they spend on this book, uh, you are donating the profits to help folks that are still going through this. And we, we don't need to lose focus, uh, that this, this, uh, this situation is not over. It's ongoing. And, uh, you know, if you're like me and, and, and you were watching this unfold and just kind of feeling helpless, this is a way, a very practical way that you can help. Um, and, uh, the, uh, the, there, there's an interesting uh, situation that you're uh, that you've got going on. They can actually buy this book directly from you, uh, and uh, and uh, and and get it directly from you signed, uh, can't they? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yep. yeah, and uh, and and in an interesting turn of events, they can actually get that for a, a, a better price directly from you for a short time uh, if they go directly to you, right? Correct. Right. Yep. Definitely. Um, get on my website, terryrhill.net. Just look for um, purchase signed copies and uh, two months with Harvey along with all my other books there are available and uh, for purchase via a PayPal account. Awesome. 
uh, Terry, you're, you're doing the Lord's work with the book and, um, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, also we're going to send everybody to pick up a copy of Joseph. Uh, if it would make a phenomenal Christmas present, uh, or, you know, if, if you're like me and my family, uh, we're kind of reading Joseph together, uh, as a, uh, kind of a, a reminder to step away from what Christmas has become and, and try to look at it, uh, through the eyes of, you know, uh, what, uh, someone that, that folks think, you know, was a bystander, but, uh, was, you know, was right there in the mix of it. Right. And, uh, maybe to try to get a, get a, a different perspective for me and, uh, and hopefully for, for those around me as well. Um, so Terry, thanks for what you're doing. Um, your, your website again was, uh, terryrhill.com. Dot net. Dot net, excuse me, terryrhill.net. Uh, we're going to send everybody over to pick up a copy. Uh, thanks so much for taking time to come on the show. I thoroughly enjoyed it as always, Hank. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Brian moved in closer, entering the rusty greenhouse through its eastern arch, keeping clear of the subject's line of sight. He pressed through the rose house, nothing but thorns, and into the grapery, nothing but vines. The meditation tones of the wind chimes were like fingers lipping crystal goblets. Two marble children hugged each other, swallowed by the swamp of a neglected fountain. Brian's shadow entered the palm house, the domed space at center, and the rest of him followed. Brian took aim at the figure's back and whistled. Hands up there! The figure waggled its shoulders a little, reaching for a weapon, maybe. Did you hear me? Hands up! Now! Brian circled the intruder. He took out his penlight and shone it in the man's face. Shit! Burlap and buttons. Just one of the stupid scarecrows. He thumbed his calm. False alarm! But Abby didn't reply. He'd lost signal. He slung his rifle back and put up his fists. He delivered a slow-motion punch to the scarecrow's head, an old potato sack with black lettering down one cheek. Its red button eyes were sewn on with plastic thread, maybe dental floss. The mouth was a bright red shoestring hot glued to the burlap. One end had shaken loose so that the mouth drooped like a stroke victim's. Brian delivered a slow karate kick to its body a business suit stuffed with hay. A stink rose. The guts were rotted. Only this one scarecrow had survived the storm. A couple dozen others had fallen face down in the mud of the palm house, strewn about like martyrs of some great scarecrow war. Motion caught his eye, and he frowned. A second scarecrow had survived the storm. He hadn't noticed it before, but he should have. This one wore a yellow hard hat and carried an axe. The hard hat was caked with mud, as if the scarecrow had been on the ground. Had someone righted it? Brian turned away from it, disturbed, and noticed a third scarecrow leaning against a nearby wall. This one wore a clown costume and mud-soaked rainbow hair. How the hell had he missed that one? He was an idiot. If that had been a person, they might have shot him in the head by now. He backed away from the trio of scarecrows. They reminded him of some Sunday school tableau. He was about to make his exit when a white face flew from the shadows. The hockey mask of Jason Voorhees, the machete-wielding psychopath of the Friday the 13th movies. The mask landed at Brian's feet and stared up at him. It was a dime-store plastic thing, trailing a broken length of pink rubber band with two sad hollows for eyes above an extruded nub of nose. The cheeks were pierced with little holes and bore three bloody streaks of war paint. Some poor scarecrow had lost its fright mask. Brian bent and picked it up, turned it in his hand, letting moonlight play across the concave interior face, creating that optical illusion where the gaze follows you. He lifted the mask, thinking of some childhood Halloween. When? Decades ago, when he'd been Jason Voorhees, stalking Sleepy Hollow, his tinfoil machete dripping Heinz 57. 
When did I get to be so old? People didn't appreciate the classic scares anymore. The old shock cuts and startle tricks. He made little panting horror flick sounds. Ch -ch -ch -ah -ah. Held the mask to his own face and looked through its cut-out eyes. Trick or treat, he whispered. The answer was trick. A dozen scarecrows surrounded him. A dozen more writhed up from the mud. The eyeless corpse of Ferris the gate guard shrugged a hungry pecking crow and pounced. <laughs>